Hallelujah. Fathers, we confess in song, we now confess in prayer. Our Lord Jesus Christ has risen from the grave. We serve a resurrected Messiah and Savior and Sovereign who is crucified in our place, who bore the burden of our sin's punishment upon His back. Lord, and on that great day, three days after the penalty was sufficient for the sins of the elect, our Savior burst forth, breaking the seal of Rome, moving the stone aside and leaving death behind as He defeated the final enemy. Lord, in light of this glorious power, if that same Spirit would indwell us, what great power and what great things might you accomplish through your church, submitted to Christ and Christ alone. Lord, I pray this morning that you would bow our hearts in submission before the Lordship of Jesus, that we, Lord, as a result of hearing his word proclaimed, might apply these truths, be diligent ambassadors, faithful servants, joyful advocates, and enduring saints, Lord, to bring the message of hope in Christ alone to a world that's dying, eternally dying, for lack of it. This morning, for those who may be new in the faith, we pray that you would use the proclamation of your word to fit stones, foundation stones, underneath them that they might find an anchor for their soul. For those who are facing trial, they would find your word sufficient this day to encourage them to remain steadfast, immovable, and abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that you will guide them through and that you have a purpose in the difficult times as well as the joyful. For the mature Lord in the faith, I pray that you would give them Conviction to find others to disciple and to, to give them, Lord, the testimony and some extra resources along the way for the lost. We pray that the word would cut to the heart that they might cry, men and brethren, what must I do to be saved? And in asking that they would find Jesus Christ to be a sufficient Savior proclaimed, witnessed by his people yet today. As we follow the Lord in the footsteps of those who echoed these truths so long ago, that your kingdom would advance, your church would grow, Lord, and that you would erase the spots and blemishes from your bride, that we might be presentable before your throne by the power of Christ and his saving work. Bless the reading, bless the proclamation of your word now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Well, I trust it's with joyful anticipation that the Lord has gathered us as saints to worship Him and to hear His word proclaimed. Turn with me to Genesis 47. Let us continue to chronicle the work of God and the life of Jacob and his sons as God's story of redeeming His people continues in another chapter in Egypt itself. The title of this morning's message is Egypt versus Israel. We'll cover a couple differences that we see developing in the text between this nation state of Egypt, constituted under Pharaoh and second in command, Joseph, and the way the, organize, or the society is organized, and then future distinctions between that and the nation of Israel, who will receive their constitution in several hundred years under Moses and be a light and a blessing as they follow God's word and law to all the nations of the earth, including Egypt, where they find themselves in our text today. The aim of this morning's message is to identify the substance of Genesis 47 shadows. The shadow versus substance distinction is found in Colossians 2.17, where we are told that in the Old Testament we see shadows of things that are anticipating their substance or fulfillment in the new. And it's surprising to see how many shadows, if you will, Types, figures, metaphors, figures of speech at times, and scenarios which echo or foreshadow that uh, fulfillment to come. So my goal in preaching for two sermons in wrapping up chapter 47 is to identify four of these, and I submit that we see them by contrast, and we'll get more into that in a moment. In the meantime, out of reverence for God's holy and infallible word, would you stand with me for the reading of the same? Listen with your hearts in reverence and fear as we hear the scriptures proclaimed in our ears today, Genesis 47, 18 through 22. And when that year was ended, they came to him and the following year and said to him, we will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent. 
The herds of livestock are my Lord's. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our land. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, and we, will, and we with our land will be servants to Pharaoh. And give us sea that we may live and not die, and that the land may not be desolate. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh and for the Egyptians, for all the Egyptians sold their fields. Because the famine was severe on them, the land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he made servants of them from one end of Egypt to the other. Only the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had a fixed allowance from Pharaoh and lived on the allowance that Pharaoh gave them, therefore he did not sell their land. This is the word of God. You may be seated. There is an explicit contrast drawn in our text as we continue to read, highlighted in verse 27. This contrast illustrates a surprising difference between the foreigners, sojourners, the Israelites who are taking temporary, although it will be a long time, residence in Egypt, and the regular citizens, the ordinary inhabitants. Notice verse 27. Thus Israel, so that would be Jacob and company, all of Jacob's family, servants, etc. Thus Israel settled in the land of Egypt, in the land of kids. Where did Israel settle? In the land of? Sorts of Goshen, thank you. Thus Israel settled in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, notice, and they gained possessions in it. And they were fruitful and multiplied greatly. Wait, they gained possessions? They were fruitful and they multiplied? I thought this was a time of famine. Well, it is. In spite of famine, on the one side of the country, the Egyptians were losing their possessions. All right, because of famine, I should say. On the one side of family, the Egyptians of the country, the Egyptians were losing their possessions. They were losing their property. They were losing their liberty. They became slaves, servants of Pharaoh. They lost everything and remained at this stage at the mercy of the king of the land. Now, in Goshen, there's some sojourners, foreigners. They're not citizens of Egypt. But a surprising contrast is drawn. Instead of losing all their land, they are gaining possessions. The flocks and herds that have been traded for food in the short term to Pharaoh have been herded over to Goshen. And the extra expert shepherds of Jacob's sons have been taking care of Pharaoh's growing flocks. They're prospering in the land. They are fruitful. They are multiplying. They are having children, many of them. Their family will explode, multiply, expand exponentially. Give it a few centuries. They, historians figure, will be a million strong. Quite the contrast. I believe that this verse sets up or gives us a little bit of a hermeneutical clue. Hermeneutics is the discipline of interpreting a text here, particularly the scripture. My submission is, is that Moses, in recording this passage in, or in 47, is setting up contrasts. He is highlighting the differences between the ordinary order of things in a pagan nation such as Egypt, Joseph's leadership notwithstanding, and God's divine purposes and order that we will continue to see unfold in national Israel. Genesis is winding down. It's chapter 47. At the moment we're preaching in, there's just two, three more, so 50 chapters in this book. Kids, what is the book that immediately follows Genesis? It goes Genesis, then Exodus. Exodus, very good. So although there are hundreds of years from the time of Joseph to the time of Moses, in the text that time is compressed. In other words, in the literary structure of the Bible, it is intended to see that Egypt is ordered like so, and then it will be followed by the revelation of a new nation and a new order and a new identity of the people to follow. And so Genesis and Exodus back to back serve to illustrate things like this. Genesis is winding down. It will be followed by the sequel, Exodus. Not only would God's people gain possessions and be fruitful and multiply in stark contrast to the citizens of Egypt who are languishing in famine, 
But chapter 47, our passage today, and a few verses beyond, they anticipate other contrasts and differences as well. The destiny of God's people continues to unfold. As it continues to unfold in covenant history, we find that the nation of Israel, that is Jacob and company, a growing company, their experience, their identity, and their social order, which would be the way the society is organized, you could say government, their experience, their identity, and their social order would be distinct from the pagan nations. It would be distinct from the nations around them. And this is not a discrimination or a false inflated cultural identity where they think, oh, we have Israeli exceptionalism by virtue of our history alone or ourselves or our accomplishments. We are a much better nation than others and so on some sort of narcissistic patriotism. They celebrate their nation as better than all the rest. No, it is better in many respects, but it's only, in better, it's only better insofar as they are submitted in obedience to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and order their nation and their society according to God's word. And that is always true. A nation is never exceptional, and patriotism is always narcissistic, unless it's with reference to the law of God. There's something to be proud of or to take identity in, insofar as the name and the authority of Jesus Christ is upheld. And short of that, we should repent. This is the message here, and it applies to us. So they would be distinct, that is, Israel, from the other nations. But this distinction would not just be to glorify God by illustrating the difference, but also as a light and a blessing. Do you remember Genesis 22, 17 through 18? Isaac is commanded, excuse me, Abraham commanded to sacrifice his son Isaac. A lamb, a substitute is provided, a ram that is. And, and thus, and then the Lord speaks and says, he reiterates that covenant promise. I will make of you a great nation, Abraham. He goes on to prophesy that through Abraham's lineage, he would both, that is Abraham in company, if you will, Isaac, Jacob, and those that follow, they would both possess the gates of their enemies and become a blessing to all the nations of the earth. So fulfillment of this text is recorded in this passage and will continue to be documented as the Lord reveals the constitution of national Israel in due time. Let me just anticipate, or let me give you a scriptural reference that anticipates the purpose in this difference. In Deuteronomy 4, we see God revealing to Moses some reasons for how he is setting up this nation, this people. Verse 5, See, I have taught you statutes and rules, as the Lord my God commanded me, Moses speaking, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who when they hear all these statutes will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to them whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? Let me ask you, church, does that principle still apply? As you order your life in contradistinction, in stark and obvious difference to the decaying culture around you, do you realize that that is a light and a blessing to the pagans? And that when you seek to be a godly family, where the husband is taking spiritual initiative in his home to lead his family in godliness, he's taking responsibility for his charge and walking according to the instructions laid out in Deuteronomy 6 and 11 and Ephesians 6 to lead his family regularly in basic applications like family worship and getting to church on time, that what he is doing is raising up his children and, and alongside his help meet wife, raising them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Does that not look starkly different than the default parenting that we see in the world today? Babysitting, or most children raised in our culture are babysat by multiple screens streaming 
any kind of depraved nonsense to them, nonstop in such a way as to warp their psyche and set them up for failure almost immediately upon leaving the confines of the entitlement class that is their home, their government, and the society, setting them up for failure. Well, in stark contrast to this, when families order themselves according to the word of God, as Jacob's family is learning more and more how to do, it becomes a stark difference and a testimony to the world around. Genesis 47 has personal family applications. It has national applications. It has a broad, as a broad scope, it illustrates to us that when we follow Christ, there are purposes that God has through it beyond even what we might ask or we might realize or imagine to glorify him as he advances his church through these ways. With that, let me uh, make two major points today under this heading. Genesis 47 sets up two contrasts we'll consider today. Number one, a contrast of provisions. That is a difference of provisions and where they come from. Number two, a priesthood contrast. We read something of the priesthood in Egypt. Egyptian priests in verses 21 and 22. And we see a contrast being set up there as well. Two more contrasts in the future, a political one and a people's. Uh, the identity of the culture as well will cover at a later time, Lord willing. Genesis 47, number one, sets up a contrast of provision. Notice in verse 18, And when that year was ended, they, who are they? The Egyptians, who are desperate for it because of the famine. Not the Israelites, who are dwelling in Goshen, well-fed and well-supplied by mercy and grace alone. No, but by the cost, at great cost, even all their land property, all their holdings and liberty, the people are desperate. The Egyptian citizens are once again coming to Joseph, crying out for his mercy to save them because they are starving. We will not hide from our Lord, they say, that our money is all spent. So ordinarily our provision is secured by our money. These people are desperate. Their bank accounts are drained. Their herds are sold and their uh, fields are dry. The herds and livestock, the herds of livestock are my Lord's, they say. There's nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our land. <clears throat> Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? So they offer themselves. They say, buy us and our land for food, and we with our land will be servants to Pharaoh. And give us seed that we may live and not die and that the land may not be desolate. What is for the ordinary Egyptian, or you can extend that, just the ordinary worldly person, the tangible source of provision? Is it not the fields? If they don't grow, we don't have food. Well, secondarily speaking, that of course makes sense. But what if your fields run dry? Is it not the sovereign, the highest conceivable authority, the governor, the king, to whom you make your appeal, and are not most people bound, basically, and enslaved in their idea of where their food comes from to nothing much higher than that? If the government will not save me, in desperate times of crisis, where will I turn? If someone is not a believer, they don't have the answer to that question. And they end up selling themselves, their souls, most importantly, their liberty, their property, and everything to a false God for the promise of provision. You know, when times are good, people are arrogant and indulgent. But when times are bad, people are desperate and they will worship just about any idol who holds out a thin promise of hope. And this is a contrast that we see set up in the text. In times of crisis, in times of lack, in famine, in wilderness, where will you turn for provision? Will it be to Pharaoh or will it be to the one who owns a cattle, I the cattle on a thousand hills? The one who spoke this world into existence by the word of his power in the first place. Egypt, in the greater story of scripture, becomes synonymous or becomes associated, I should say, with famine. Egypt is now twice associated with hard times such as these. Think of three generations ago, Genesis 12, 10 through 16, Abraham travels to Egypt just like Jacob is doing now. 
And we remarked at the time, Genesis 12, Abraham journey, Abraham's journey is identified by two things, I would say. They're both negative. Provisional hope for survival. So uh, I, I just need to survive, and this is the best way I know to find food. Go south where, by the Nile, perhaps the fields are still fertile. And the second thing is covenant compromising fear of man. Abraham feared man, and as a result, he compromised his covenant, particularly with his wife. Covenants are always compromised when we fear man more than God. And so he said, pretend that you're my sister. Uh, otherwise, I'm afraid that they'll kill me. So he's more concerned about his own life than protecting his wife and puts her at risk by basically advertising she's available. And then sure enough, he gets in all kinds of problems and trouble. God rescues his servant in spite of his sin and weakness and his covenant compromise, but he leaves Egypt and he leaves with possessions, but only because God tells Pharaoh, hey, don't lay a finger on my son. If you do, you know, you have hell to pay quite literally. So the Pharaoh gives him a whole bunch of blessings, sends him on his way, chides him for lying to him in the first place. Abraham leaves. Egypt, in redemptive historical th terms, uh, becomes symbolic of short-term refuge and long-standing tyranny. Short-term refuge, long-standing tyranny. The promises of salvation, anything short of the true Savior, fall into that same category. Short-term promises, long-standing bondage. The promise of sin is happiness and joy. Sins of self-indulgence for a season. And for a little bit there is the prodigal spending your father's inheritance. The wine women in song lift your spirits, but it's superficial. They lift you up to dash you upon the rocks of God's judgment, the consequences of denying his law, and the reality of life without responsibility and submission to the author of life. And so then you begin to see the consequences of short-term blessing, our long-standing bondage and tyranny. And so the call of the gospel is go home. Go home to your father who owns all the cattle you can imagine. Better to be a servant there than to eat the swine food of the short-term promises of this world. <clears throat> this happened to the people then. It's a principle throughout the scriptures. When I say redemptive historical terms, I just wanted to emphasize this and to clarify. I realize this week I use that term quite often. Redemptive history and covenant history. So kids in the room, you guys have been going through, if you're involved in the young people's study, Bible study, the uh, gospel project curriculum, and sometimes you'll be asked in there, uh, the, or you'll consider a big picture question, right? And that big picture question is, how does this passage of scripture or this story we're learning about relate to the big story of scripture? Man fell, man needs redemption, Jesus came to save, and then there's future glory. Creation, fall, redemption, glory. So that's the big story of Scripture. And you kids know this because you've been studying along these lines. So just know that when I say things like uh, covenant history or redemptive history, that's what we're talking about, the big picture theme of the Bible. And my point to you is this, that Egypt as far as what it symbolizes or represents in the big picture theme of the Bible is short-term refuge, but long-standing tyranny. The promises of this world that fall short. Egypt illustrates the fatal cost of humanist hopes of salvation. Finding a way by the means at your mere human disposal. It's like another version of the Tower of Babel, or it's like the modern ghost cities of China. You heard about these? They tell us that in China there are huge cities with huge buildings, and they give the impression, if you just saw them from a satellite view, of a powerful, influential society with great reach and wealth and towers in the sky. Yeah, they have them. We have our modern pyramids, so to speak, today. But they're really a facade, and they're superficial. And you go to some of these cities, not a soul there, or maybe there's just a couple. But it's an illusion of security, and assurance, and hope. Every Tower of Babel is like that. If you visit Washington, D.C., and you try to walk around, you know, just try to walk around the government buildings made of marble that stretch into the distance as far as the eye could see. 
under hundreds and hundreds of acronyms representing government agencies ostensibly there to save you or to guarantee safety, security, provision, and assurance in the future, you will never be able to walk around them in a single day. I don't know how many days it'll take, but I feel pretty assured, pretty confident that you'll get tired before you complete that journey. What is this? It's Babel. It's the Tower of Babel in our modern day. And it's there in every age. This is Egypt, short-term refuge, long-standing tyranny. <clears throat> On the other hand, where is true provision to be found? We're setting up, a, Moses is setting up a contrast here. There will be another wilderness time. There will be other times of trial that the people will be called to endure, will they not? How about when they leave Egypt? There'll be 40 years where they have to find their food somewhere. Where will they find it? Well, in Exodus 16, we find that they will find sovereign bread supplied for them by the Lord himself. Verse 12, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel, the Lord says, say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay around the camp, and when the dew had gone, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as the frost on the ground. And when the people saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Kids, what do we call this? This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each of you, as much as you can eat. You shall each take an omer according to the number of the persons that each of you has in his tent. More instructions follow on how to steward the provisions of the Lord. So on the one hand, you have Egypt. Sell us everything, even yourselves into slavery, and we promise to sustain you. God sets his people free, gives them liberty. How then shall we eat? I will give you bread from heaven. This is not to say that God doesn't ordinarily feed his people through stewardship. He does. Stewarding the land so that it blooms and grows with crops to supply our needs is a means that God, in, under ordinary circumstances, supplies. But we must always remember that this is according to his mercy and to his grace. And no less sovereign is the bread that comes to our table by virtue of the agriculture of this nation than the bread that came down from heaven to spare the people in the wilderness. This is not a result of our economy. This is not a result of the uh, legislation, administration, or policy promises of the latest governing board, body, governor, president, etc. No, this is God's mercy that has laid a table before us each time when we sit down to eat. And there is a contrast between provisions in Egypt secured at the cost of your own slavery and bread coming down from heaven in the wilderness time of desperation to illustrate to the people, the Lord is your provision. This is his world. Do not worship a golden calf or Pharaoh or anyone else or sell your souls for the promise of short-term gain because the long-term bondage ultimately in hell itself is not worth it, obviously. The least that could be said. Sovereign bread. This picture of sovereign bread in the big picture again, kids, of the Bible story, it advances. We see in contrast to Egypt, God's provision. And then in John chapter 6, Jesus fulfills pictures like this. We see more of God's purposes in illustrating these things. In John 6, this is our worship text this morning. What does Jesus say? Again, the aim of this message we see uh, shadows in the Old Testament, and we see substance in the New. This would be a good example, 631, book of John. This, Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he sent. Excuse me, verse 30. And they said to him, what sign will you do that we might believe in you? They said, 31, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses Listen, who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. Amen. Not Moses, not Pharaoh, not the economy, not the president. It is God who gives you the bread from heaven. That was true with the foodstuffs that you ate in the wilderness, and that is true, and even more so important, the importance infinitely greater 
when it comes to your spiritual condition. Jesus said to them, 32, truly, truly, or excuse me, 33, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. That bread that came down from heaven and appeared miraculous to the people, it was a shadow of what was to come. Bread, that is spiritual provision from heaven, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus himself would take on flesh, be born of a woman, and appear as dew, so to speak, on the landscape of history at Christmas. And when Jesus was born, this signaled sovereign bread, divine provision unto eternal life. The famine of our sin and its consequences now is answered. The prayers of the faithful now have been answered in Jesus Christ. 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. He has said this of water as well in chapter 4. As I recall, the Samaritan lady there says, How would you like to drink from a well? You never go thirsty again. Water that gives eternal life. I am that water. In so many words, Jesus Christ. So there's a provision contrast. You can find your hope in Egypt and end up being a slave. You can invest and hedge your bets in this world and end up suffering the consequences of your sin. You might have some short-term gain, but there's long-standing tyranny, and it ends in hell itself. Or you can trust the God who is king of kings, greater than Pharaoh, greater than Moses, and sent his son to come and die for you. And when we feast at his table, the Lord's table in two weeks, it is a, partic- it is a symbol, it's a sign, it's a message to our souls. We are participating in, we are partaking in the very means of our spiritual life, the promised land of glory. So you see how these things are set up through the text, do we not? This contrast even becomes more emphasized even more when we compare the tyranny of Egypt to the prosperity of Canaan. Back in our text today, or close to it, as I said to you, we're going to turn a chapter, Exodus will begin, in chapter 3, we'll begin to reveal things like this, verses 7 and 8. And the Lord said, I've surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them. So if I was leading a Bible study with you kids, I might say, give me three things that characterize Egypt. Three things that uh, are adjectives or characterize Egypt. Let me read again, see if you pick them out. Verse 7. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. Verse 7, there's the three. Affliction, taskmasters, and suffering. That's Egypt. Egypt in chapter 47 is set up as a contrast. What does Egypt represent? Affliction, taskmasters, and suffering. Isn't it the promise of food? Yeah, at the cost of your soul. That's the picture. But there is a promised land, a place that's different, circumstances that are a a sharp difference from this. Verse 8, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. That is, I've come to deliver them from their affliction, from their taskmasters and their sufferings. And to do what? Verse 8 continues. And to bring them out of that land to a good and broad land flowing with milk and honey. And so if we were to take that same Bible study quiz, what characterizes the promised land? Good land, broad land, flowing with milk and honey. Milk and honey are metaphors. My kids love milk. We do a milk run. Maybe some of you guys do. So every, so every couple of weeks, we get like, I don't know, eight gallons in the fridge, and it goes quickly. We also buy honey by the gallon. Yes, we do have a big family. But we also have insatiable appetites for milk and honey at our house. It tastes so good. And there's so much you can do with it. And isn't it interesting that these symbols of prosperity and provision from the old still relate to us now? Gold is a similar picture in scripture. People still value gold. I mean, my kids are fascinated with it. A few of you guys we mentioned before have metal detectors. What if you found a stash of gold? You would have a story to tell your buddies. I'm sure you wouldn't wait till the next Sunday. You'd get on the phone and tell everyone you're rich. These pictures in the Bible of overflowing prosperity, the promise of God fulfilled, are seen in these images, milk, honey, and gold, and streets of gold as well. Egypt, taskmasters, affliction, slavery, promised land, God's order, God's way of doing things, the fruit of following his law, 
basing your life and your future and your hope of provision now and eternally on him, what is it? Good land, broad land, flowing with milk and honey and ultimately giving way to the tree of life, the throne of the Almighty, streets paved with gold, mansions in glory, and crowns for those obedient to him. They might cast that as an offering in worship with the elders and join the seraphim forever singing, Holy, holy, holy is the lamb that was slain to secure for me the glories of life eternal. Provision contrast. Egypt, famine, taskmasters. Sovereign bread in the wilderness picture and fulfilled in Jesus Christ, manna from heaven. Promised land, prosperity. Yes, there's challenges, there's trials, there's tests of faith, there's enemies in the land. It goes on even in this passage in Exodus 3 to say that there are peoples there that must be overcome. But you have a mighty God, one mighty enough to part the sea, mighty enough to give you bread with his own hand each day in the morning. Do you have any reason to doubt he won't through your untrained sword slay the inhabitants of Jericho? How about you try me? Walk around it seven times. See what happens. Kids, what happened? Seventh day, they walk around Jericho seven times. They blew the trumpets, ram's horns. They shouted, and what happened? I heard it back there. The walls fell down. That's right. And so, yes, the promised land is not without trial. But for those who followed God's word, they found him to be true. We can trust as well in the trials of our day. The scriptures go on to draw a distinction of salvation in Egypt versus salvation out of Egypt. Back in our primary text in Genesis 47, the people desperate in famine sought salvation in Egypt. And we see this. They brought their livestock. They gave them as offerings. Basically, you could see this. And they brought themselves. They turned over themselves as offerings. We think in the New Testament in Romans 12 how God commands us to present ourselves as living sacrifices to the Lord. And sort of the counterpart of that is you present yourself as a living sacrifice to the Lord of the land, right? And so they, they say, why should we die before your eyes? Both we and our land buy us and our land for food. And with you and we with our land will be servants to Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die and that the land may not be del- a desolate. Salvation in Egypt. Please save us. We're dying. We're starving. This is all we have to offer. We are completely at your mercy. There's a fundamental contrast in the scriptures. Again, this is symbolic in the greater story of the Bible. Egypt represents selling yourself for salvation found in this world. The world is the place of bondage and oppression, Egypt included, symbolizing captivity to sin. It is insufficient for salvation. The scriptures later pick up on some of these themes and passages like Hosea 11. Just listen as the prophet proclaims. When Israel was a child, verse 1, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Notice that language. Out of Egypt I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to Baals and burning offerings to idols. They want to go back to Egypt. They're dancing around Baal, thinking that it will rain in Elijah's day and so forth. They raise up the golden calves. They want the comfort, the provisions, the foodstuffs, the convenience of Egypt. At least though we were servants, we had leeks and onions to eat. They keep sacrificing to these idols. Yet it was I, the Lord continues, verse 3, who taught them Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love. And I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws. These people, so broken by slavery and so immature in their faith, generally speaking, when they were saved out of Egypt, needed to be taught how to be worshipers of the one true God. They needed their faith built, and they needed a foundation underneath them. And God was patient and did so through various means under Moses and Joshua. Yet there was a real difference, and there was a conflict in the heart of many. Will salvation be found in Egypt and what it represents? Or is there salvation out of Egypt? Out of Egypt, I have called my son. These words, of course, give way to their fulfillment in Matthew 2, 12 through 15, where Jesus himself travels out of Egypt and back to the place where God had ordained he would be raised by his earthly mother and father, Mary and Joseph, thus fulfilling this text. Out of Egypt, I have called my son. 
Where do you hope for salvation? In Egypt or out of Egypt? Uh, I think it's Second Peter t- tells us that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people called out to testify to the uniqueness and glory. We have a new identity. We are a new people. We are a new culture. We have new values, if you will. These are ways that we commonly apply these identity points. And we are a priesthood. We are set apart, consecrated. We are ambassadors of the Lord. And we are called to represent him in this world. And we are different by design. Different by design. Because just like God called Abraham to be a light to the nations and Israel to be different, that a certain jealousy would arise among the neighboring peoples, not that they would have the wealth of riches that Israel had necessarily, but that they would have the wealth of wisdom and the assurance of hope and the covenant blessings of the Messiah who was to come. This same thing we are called to do today. The temptation, short term, is to blend too much with the world. The trials that we have today often place pressure on us to adopt, to conform, to tolerate, to affirm what the world, what Egypt says is righteous and just and true. We are not, we don't find salvation in Egypt. We don't find security by going along to get along in a world that finds its identity in their antichrist hatred, ultimately speaking, that manifests itself in all kinds of wicked forms. But instead, we are to find our identity in Christ and realize that that distinct contrast is on purpose. If the light is turned on, how is it supposed to dispel the darkness? If it's under a bushel, as the scriptures say, then it is greatly shrouded and ineffective for its purpose. If it's hidden somewhere in a hole, then it can't be seen by others. But if it's set on a hill... It establishes a point of reference. What good is a lighthouse if it's only on the internet? The ship on the sea will crash into the rocks. But if that flashing light on the cliff is boldly proclaiming, steer here and die, steer clear and live, then the sailor, if they would heed that objective standard of salvation in the metaphor, will be spared destruction, shipwreck, and judgment. And so we, like God's people then, were called, are called now to set our light, not in a hole somewhere, but on the cliff, and say, steer here and die, steer clear and live. Repent, turn that wheel 180 degrees, steer away from this salvation in Egypt rocks, and find out there, though the open sea may have some uncertainty to it, that Jesus Christ is your anchor in the storm. And in him alone is eternal life. So this calling that the, Egyptian, or that the Israelites had in spite of their Egyptian context is something that relates directly to us. There's a contrast of provision. I might have to extend this to a mess- one more message because I've only gotten through one point this morning. So let's just consider that this message actually had four as I restructure it briefly for you and bring it to a close. You guys like how I'm self-editing? This is something that is very hard for me, so I hope you can appreciate that heading. Genesis 47 sets up the following. There's a contrast between Egypt that represents famine and manna, which represents God's fulfillment or God's provision in the wilderness. There's a contrast between bread supplied you know, by the state, if you will, by the welfare and the social security promised under Pharaoh, which all it required was your own loss of complete liberty and private property. There's a contrast between that and trusting that God will lead you, guide you, and provide for you a broad and good land flowing with milk and honey sufficient for provision to accomplish his will today and ultimately fulfilled in glory because Jesus is your bread and wine, so to speak. And then finally, there's a contrast between salvation in Egypt and salvation out of Egypt. Out of Egypt, Jesus was called and we are called to follow him. Judgment came by way of famine, but there was a way out. In Egypt, the people were afflicted. They were in torment under taskmasters and slavery, but there was a way out. There would be a priesthood that would be established. We'll cover that next time. There would be a prophet who would arise, Moses, to lead the people. There would be a once and for all high priest that these priests and prophets looked forward to in Jesus Christ. 
and all who come out of Egypt in him will be saved. When he was crucified in the fullness of time, that was a sufficient sacrifice to fulfill what God had ordained the priesthood of old to figure and type and shadow. Payment must be made for sins. But when it is supplied by the true priest, notice the Egyptian priests, they couldn't do anything for the people. They ended up being rich and wealthy while the people suffered. Not our high priest. We'll cover this more later. Our high priest is not an elite who gets fat, you know, on the people while the people starve and die and lose their liberty. Our high priest died for us. Our high priest gives his own body and blood that we might live. Our high priest intercedes for us incessantly before the throne of the Father. Our high priest forever with his resurrected body bears the only scars and glory, so far as I can tell, that are proof positive that your sins are paid for. Follow this priest out of Egypt, and as you do so, you will find in the course of life and at the point of death, you will enter a broad land, a good land, flowing with the milk and honey of eternal communion and provision beyond compare and imagination and glory ultimately as we worship the Lord for what he has done. Let us transition in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to consider your scriptures. And insofar as they have been accurately represented, we pray that you would write them on the table of our souls. Pray that you would use these, uh, these understandings, Lord, as greater appreciation for your word to accomplish glory and fruit for your kingdom as we seek to live in light of these truths. Would you give us, Lord Jesus, more confidence and ability to shine brighter as you have called us to draw a distinction, to be different from the world around. And for the lost, Lord, I pray that you would call them to salvation. In particular, I want to lift up our service next week. As Jean brings your word to us next week in the open air, I pray that you would be pleased to proclaim your crown rights and your way of salvation even to our community as we symbolically step outside these walls, may you use this church and our proclamation as a light so that people might be saved out of Egypt and cling to Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us the great opportunity to be in covenant bond with you through the payment of Christ's blood. May we treasure it all the more in Jesus' name. Amen.